So are the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of this conversation. Help us to know your will of us. Help us understand more deeply our place in your plan and how to achieve it, your glory and our salvation. We entrust this time to you through our mother as we say, Hail Mary. Mm-hmm. Oh, the praise the Lord. Is mm-hmm. Blessed are thou, mm-hmm. and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Mm-hmm. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us mm-hmm. now and at the hour of our death. One of the great mysteries of the universe is us. We're mysterious to ourselves. We know that there is a war inside of us, whether things aren't right with us. It's hard to know what those things are and why they're the way they are. And one thing that we've forgotten and kind of turned away from in modern culture is this idea that man has a special place in the universe. You've lost it, you've got this idea. That human beings were created in a unique way. The book of Genesis, chapter 1, describes it like this. He says, When God created a man, God says this, Let us make man our own likeness. God created man's image. In the divine image, he created him, and the people he created them. Last time we looked at how God makes everything, everything's piled off of him. Everything that's good comes from him because he's a great. Everything must be. But when it comes to the creation of man, there's a unique yes, house description. There's a focus on this. It says that we're creating God's image and likeness. So they're not the same thing. We'll do this in a minute. Um, there are two different ideas, both very important. If you look at the, the Gospel, the, the book of Genesis, the first book of, of the Bible, you'll see in creation there's a different word we used to describe uh, creation. At the end of every day or period of creation, it looks over when he's made and says, look, this happened the first six days. It makes the animals, they're good. It makes the trees, they're good. It tells them they're good. When it comes to man, it's different. All of a sudden, the world now is very good. The seventh day, the day of rest, where we come nigh to God and join God there, and the day is blessed. So, creation is good. The creature may have been likeness is very good. But we're joined to die nigh to God and becomes blessed and good. So, today we're going to look at a couple of things. Look at, first of all, what's the need of other than likeness? What does this mean? Knowing that would then tell us why God made us. What particular role that we have in God's work. It's different than a dog or a cat or a mountain. <coughs> then we're going to look at after that how God made us originally. The original plan of God and the fall. We'll discover in the end there are three great truths of mankind. The intellect is not the same thing as the brain. That dog, cat's head brains are 
they grow up to be smarter, the intellect's become a brain. Your brain damage don't lose your soul. The intellect uses the brain as a tool, the same way that we use our hands. You miss your hands, you're going to miss them. The brain damage is going to miss it, but it's not the same thing as the intellect to the soul. It's perfect. And we know this because of the fact that physical things can only hold physical things, they can't hold spiritual things. A video device records video, an audio device records audio. I play this back, that shows video, not just an audio device. It has to be a video device. So if, in my intellect, what I know is more than just physical things, it has to be more than just a physical part. It was, a, it was only a physical part, but only hold physical things. Does that make sense? I know my, I know my soul is more than that. It's what physical things could I know? Or non physical things I know. I can know things that are abstract. Things like mathematics. <coughs> numbers, for example. Right? The numbers don't exist for your life. Yet there are things that we number. I know how many objects I have in my hand, I know how many chair tables there are. But numbers themselves don't exist. I don't go out and see a bucket of threes, or go catch some sevens off a tree. It don't exist. Not in reality. You have know, figures, like circles and squares. Again, there are circular things, there are square things. But these geometric ideas are things that Are different than the physical world. So we take a look at mathematics or geometry or things like that, they're abstractions we pull from the world and make to a higher level um, just the physical other products. Okay? This applies to more things than just the circular pentagon. Ideas that are art, material, things like freedom or justice, truth, virtue, holiness. Again, you don't see truth running around in the woods. You don't see virtue out in the garden of Philadelphia. You see acts that are virtuous, you see things that are truthful, but truth itself, or virtue, or freedom, or justice, or ideas, are material things. Most importantly, God himself is a material thing that we can come to grasp and know and come to have a relationship. And so there must be something, again, that is more than just Physical. You know, spiritual things are supported by God Himself. Free will love. So the body is not, it's not the same thing as the emotions. So we have emotions that are physical. If you to go to a doctor's office or to, to uh, you can measure, you feel certain emotions, you can, there's more hormones that rise up in that. And Anger or love or affection. So, a bone change that happen in the body, a motion happen in the brain. That's different than love. Those of you that have children can know this at three in the morning with baby fries. There's no emotional welling of affection. But there is still love. You go and feed baby. But there's not, oh boy, I can see my child one more time. They need the voice that are here. That are up here. <laughs> Or, I think I think of a time personally when I was really mad at my sister, and, and she fell in danger. Even though I was angry at her, but I ran to get air for her, because I was worried about her. I loved her, but I was mad at her. So the emotion's different than the love. Our will is a sequence of good. Its desire is true. Let's just choose good for other people. The emotions. Or what we think about, and then either they work together, they don't all work together. Look at that original side. So free will to let. This will make some of that This you can never lose. Likeness is sanctifying things. We can become more like God. Holier we get. We can stop being like God by choice of myself. We can grow in this likeness. 
If you like somebody, you do what they do, act as they act, think like they think. If you're not like that, you do different things. Why is this holy and sanctifying grace? God created me and holy and sanctifying grace. Remember, sanctifying grace that gives to God and lets us work with God. Makes us his children. Let's just go to heaven. Without this, we don't, we don't get that. We'll get some more detail we'll, in a minute. We look at the uh, original plan. But it's, for now, I mean, that's sufficient. So, if anyone makes his work with God, so he's pulling us away. Without this, we can't please God and his children are away. So, you don't want to lose this. Swiss have names. What was that? Swiss have names. Do what have names? The grace, grace. Does the grace, grace have names? The grace of. So sanctifying, so grace is a big category. There are two main kinds of grace. There are the sanctifying grace. And there's actual grace. Grace that they're grace is a gift from God, a little bit. It's perfect gift. Sanctifying grace is a grace, it's a gift from God that changes the quality of our soul. His work of God, His children make us holy, and so to heaven. Actual grace, are, and, and it remains, unless, unless we reject it by sin. Actual grace are transitory helps, or inspirations, or strengthening of will and intellect. We're trying to do the right thing. I've lost you. No, I, just, okay. I had seen something where Mary said something about the 10 rings on her finger and the 10 graces coming from them. But people don't ask for these graces, and it's like, oh, so, it, so, so grace simply means favor or love or things we need in that context. And so you're referring, you're referring to the vision of the of, to a Saint Catalabre in Miraculous Medal. Uh, Catalabre is a vision of, of Our Lady, and she's wearing these these, these rings and grace coming from her hands and her feet. And some of the rays some of the, some rays are dark. Look at the Miraculous Medal is dark rays. These are things we forget to ask ask God for. Whether it's I need help with various things, just, trust me, you'll get them anyway. They will say things. You know, you go, go to go to your person, mother, and say, you know what, I don't ask for what I need anyway, we will still get them. Uh, the Lord does not rely upon us to give us things. He wants us our permission. You have to go and say, Lord, give me what I have to ask for. Give me what I have to ask for. That's not like the grace of common brother. He's just talking about the various. Things we did in our souls to do the right thing. The various helps during the day to do that sort of things. Um, some people don't ask, for example, during temptation. You, know, you turn to Mary and say, help us. People don't ask for grace and help when we are struggling to learn things. We can ask them to help us. When we're trying to go to sleep, when we're trying to be patient, when we're trying to. There's all kinds of things we ask for from God, and turn to God, we forget. And so that vision is simply saying, turn to me in all things. Just ask me in general on But there are particular names like that. Good. Um, in the end, intellect and free will, being a person, is really important because what this means, this tells us, is we're made for relationships. You don't just think, you have to think about something. You don't just love, you have to love someone. These things are fancy verbs, go back to the old ground rules. Right? They have to connect to something else. They have to take you somewhere. Because of that, they help us in relationships. If an intellect lets us know God, all the people, if you let us love God, we'll go and work love neighbor. To form relationships, because in the end, the Trinity is three persons in a relation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we're made as persons speaking from relationships. We're made as persons to love, and to know, to good to those around us. Image, likeness, made to reflect God in a unique way. Questions on this? Okay. 
So why then did God make us? Whenever I am parent a, a couple for a baptism for their kid, they always ask this question. It's astonishing to walk when I get a blank stare. People just like, I don't know, I really want to play basketball. Or I, I know I'm made for a purpose. Okay, what is it? So when I ask you now, you see that answer up oh, zero cap. That could be an excuse anyway. But something's really important to know, really important to think about and plan for, because you don't know why we're made. Hang on, get there. Why did God make us? So the old traditional answer is God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him. In this life. And to be happy forever with him in the past. You could say, but heaven. Let me simplify. A couple things to put out here. First of all, notice God made us for eternal happiness. It doesn't always happen here on earth, but many for happiness. Second thing is, I love what you do. When I first heard this, this sounded really selfish. I know it was, it was God. It was like, okay, but. If I were to stand up here and say, by the way, guys, you're all making nobody love me and serve me. <laughs> you okay, Father? Time to go. <laughs> Call my coats back. <laughs> so how would God say? Tell him God say, make nobody love me and serve me and not be selfish. How is this not selfish of God? He's put him to, he's put him in a box that is too low and much greater than we think he is. He's the greatest mm -hmm. thing that there ever is. So. Absolutely. There's nothing better. Nothing better. Yeah. So what else did God give us that's better? So anything else God's going to make us for would be less. If God made us simply to run around and, and eat milkshakes and you know, lie in the long grass, that's less even than human beings. If God made us for each other, even for me, for me it's still be less than him. So if God doesn't make you for myself, he says, made you for something else, there's nothing better to make you for. I want you to know the greatest of all mysteries, the infinite perfect God. I want you to be in a relationship with the infinite perfect God to serve, not as a slave, as a son. To work in the greatest of all possible things, for the most important of all tasks, the greatest works with me. There's nothing better to give you. Nothing else is good enough for you. See, one of the problems of sin is that we try to say, but exchange this for something else. C.S. Lewis talks about, it says, it's not like a child playing in the mud, making mud pies, who's invited to go to the ocean. They don't want to leave because they're excited about the mud pies. They can't imagine the ocean can get any better than the mud pie. They're like, no, no, it's time to really love the ocean, be great, comes to the ocean. I'm going to play it, I'm going to go to go. That's us in sin. You know, I, I love my fourth dish chocolate cake. I love that. I don't even have to be any better than that. We're not thinking of anything big enough. God is just is, is infinitely perfect, infinitely good, and make us for that. It's so important to recognize that. To put it another way, we're made to glorify God. This is also going to try to strike us odd. To glorify is to show, manifest, make, to show people what it is. You go around and around to people who read this book, it's a great book, or watch this movie, you're glorifying the movie book. To glorify God is to show the world who he is. How do you do that? Beautiful. The more like God you are, the more close you are to 
again, but the deep relationship is with him, we glorify him. See, God being God does something no king does, no president does. Human beings, when they want to glorify themselves, they make a statue or, or, a, or a coin. Here's my face. God says, I want real people. By their happiness, by their own glory, by their greatness, they'll show who I am. So the, the, the greater you are, the more you glorify God. We are able to receive his happiness, his life, his own greatness. See, God's connected his glory with your happiness. He wants to glorify him perfectly, to be happy perfectly in him. But the ones who glorify God most, best, are the saints. The great the saints that glorify God. Even here on earth, they think, you know, the great saints on earth, we can read their lives, we can get excited about their stories, are inspired by them, they ask for help. Everything they do reminds us of who God is and they inspire us to imitate God as well. If they could do it, well, there's a chance for me too. The greater you are, the more you can receive God's happiness, God's life in heaven, the more you glorify God. It's connected to these two things. That's what I mentioned. We have to pray for that. God created us. Let's stop there. Sorry. Is there questions on this? Comments? Want to throw these mails at me? Um, <laughs> you are on camera, you realize. I got like 50. We are our body and soul. You said last time there are three kinds of persons. Divine persons, angelic persons, and human persons. Human beings are the greatest of, of, of the physical world because we are in God's image, unlike us. We're the lowest of the persons because we have bodies. Because of this, we say, but before we have this unique place in God's creation. Now, to clarify something, all too often we get this idea that our soul kind of resides in our body like a house. It'd be like some clothing. Clay's analogy was a captain of the ship. She was always what we want, to kind of storm the ride, and the captain can leave you fine. It's not what the church is on bell says. That's why I think it's not body and soul, it's body and soul. One thing, it's impossible. A better analogy for the human person. But to think of the um, paper and ink and the meaning of the page, the meaning of it on this page. What makes this be a book or a pair of information is that it means something, it communicates something, tells you something. But they can't do it without the paper and the ink. Either. If I have to put a paper with ink on it, it's not a book. If I have to have ideas of meaning without putting it down on paper, that's not a book. The paper and the ink are necessary for me to be brought to you. You can't separate the meaning out of the paper and ink without losing what it is. That's the, the, our close body and soul are. The soul is like the meaning given to the paper of the ink. The paper of the ink is at the bottom. Both necessary for us, both designed by God for us, both, both planned by God to live in this life. So you can walk in here on earth and then reign with him forever in heaven. This is the last time we were at this bridge. This bridge between heaven and earth are meant to bring the, the, the plan of God, the goodness of God, the physical world, to make for us be better, more beautiful, to help work with God in this life, and to bring back creation close to higher God. Make it uh, so we get this bridge passing on the spiritual life, the physical world, and passing this world up to God, offering it to Him. Go with them all. One thing that's really important to recognize when God created, 
God left the world in a very real sense unfinished. Right? Things aren't over, and things still change, things still grow, people are still being born. It's worked. And God did it this way um, because He wants us as His children, by His image and likeness, to work with Him in this life. You do what He does. He doesn't need help, God doesn't require help. But the Lord, it's very clear in the scripture, tells man to help him create. Genesis chapter 1, sorry, Genesis 2, verse 15, says, The Lord God took the man and settled him in the garden of Eden. To do what? To cultivate it and to care for it. Cultivate suggests you're watering the wild and different plant. Growing, you're saying, you know, I, I, you know, the roses go over here and the apples go over there. You're choosing your plan, you're changing it. God wants man to cultivate the garden. He needs man's help, it's not because he can do it. As we talked about last time, this is this wants man to be truly be his children, do what he does, make it be a better place. Most important is it occurs in silence. We get to choose by our actions, by our, by our choices, by the, the, what we're going to do. We choose to tell lies, we become liars. We choose to reject God, we become sinful. We choose to say yes to God, we're good, we become old. The Lord has left us in our own hands, in the words of some of the saints, and said, Make yourselves well. Right. And then the Lord trusts each other. Help each other become old, become good, we all God. And this to me is, is very, very key to understanding human beings. That's man has to work with. This is why he has his definitely the apostles. This is why he makes the church. This is why he has sacraments. He wants human beings to have a share of his creation. They're meant to be his children, made right? in his image and likeness. They're meant to walk with him and work with him to love him. And it's tremendous yet. This, is, this makes our free will real in our daily lives. Lets our choices and our love for God and our freedom mean something. If I were to tell you I have a restaurant here, do you want to choose fish or chicken? Bye. Which one do you want? Fish. You want fish or chicken? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. Aren't you glad you're free? Freedom means there has to be a real, real thing. And the Lord lets us not only choose choose good and bad, because you had to choose to protect him. You had to choose what good is he? You had to truly help me in my creation. Tremendous, tremendous people. Questions on this? Yeah. Let's look then at the original state of man. How we were created in God's written plan. Because the way we are now is not what God planned for us. We messed up. Spoiler, sorry. See, in God's plan wasn't really easy to serve God. This life would have been very pleasant, very easy. There was, there was no death, no suffering, there was no struggle. There was a transition that would live life here on earth, 100 years, a thousand years, no more. And at the end of it, there would have been your body and soul, but the way life should, so the way you know, it would have been that. I said, okay, I'm ready, I'm going to finish my task for you. I'm ready to go now. You just elevate the higher plane. Not the way it is here. Let's first look at how God planned things, then we'll see then what happened and how that affects it. So God gave Adam and Eve three groups of gifts. The natural gifts, the preternatural gifts, and the supernatural gifts. Natural gifts are those that make us be what we are. Physical gifts. Nature is who what matters. It includes the Garden of Eden, all around us, those parts of the world around us, ourselves. 
So he gave Adam and Eve a body with the senses. They would see him through their eyes, hear his, hear his voice, feel his works with their hands. We have emotions, attractions for good things over here. Right? So food is pleasant to us. There's attraction for the opposite sex. There's attraction for friendships. And originally in God's plan, we are meant to rejoice in God's gifts entirely, body and soul. See a beautiful sunset, even know it, that's good. You choose the Lord's plan and then you rejoice in it in your emotions. Emotions are meant to kind of join in to those things. It's meant to be that our mind knows God's will, the will chooses God's will, and the emotions join in. What happens all too often is these days is the emotions see something they want. The will chooses that because the feel looks good to us. And our mind's up with an excuse for why it's okay. It's backwards. But we're skipping ahead of course. Um, Adam was able to see the material things of the earth, that bless God for them, thank God for rejoice them. Use them for his own good, the good of those around him. Adam and Eve could rejoice in each other, recognize the goodness and beauty they had, recognize they made another enlightenment, so that was no loss to greed or pride or selfishness. He's rejoicing the other person, love them entirely, see them for what they were, and thank God for them. Rejoice in them, body and soul. Whatever you do, everything's the glory of God. Adam did this. Secondly, God gave Adam the soul, intellect and free will, making him a person. You know what that's what was like. You choose one. So all the things of nature he chose. Preternatural gifts are things that don't change what we are, but adore and elevate. If I were to take a Dixie cup and glue, hot glue, press a gem on it, still a Dixie cup. But all of a sudden, it's really valuable, a Dixie cup. Haven't changed the nature, I haven't changed what it is, but I made it special. Although the God would take us that's my story. <laughs> the Dixie Cup of Kings. <laughs> Preternatural gifts are those things that, that elevate us and don't change us. There are at least five to talk about. They had knowledge, they had integrity, immortality, and passability and happiness. God poured into Adam and Eve an infused knowledge. They didn't have to learn things from when they were afraid. They prayed as adults. So I gave them special knowledge. And they knew they were really smart. They knew. They had knowledge of things all of God. One of the great gifts is gifts of integrity. Integrity, um, too often in the day, means being truthful. In this sense, think of the word, don't think of the word in integer in mathematics. An integer is a whole number. Integrity meant there was a wholeness to that. See, now I believe their body, their emotions was under the control of their will. Perfect. For us, our emotions are like wild animals. You can kind of cage them up, release them up, they run around in anyway. We can't help what we feel all this. Wish we could kind of practice it, but it's not going to work for it. Not for me. Adam had the control over their emotions that we have for our hands and feet. They could say, you know what? I don't want to be angry. Not be angry. Was there anger and like sadness before the fall? Or was that not even really emotion? The emotions were, were possible, but they probably didn't feel it at that point. Um, but, I mean, for example, there, there was death of other things around them. So I'm sure if they had a special pet, they would feel sad that, you know, Fluffy the Bunny died here. Okay. You know. Uh, but it wouldn't be the same. Wouldn't it be a lung sadness? Or would it be. Um, they didn't experience it the same way. Um, and from the context, of, no, we're not really told the context of scripture, they're probably never very long. They probably went there for a day or two before they fell. So, they probably didn't long enough to even experience a whole lot of things. 
but I'm not really told that's what it seems like. It's based on context, of course. Um, so the impossibility was there, but it would have been directed toward good things and not out of control of the lives. Um, so it would have been appropriate anger, appropriate sadness, or appropriate joy. Um, so for us, for example, you know, um, we smell dessert. I don't, I don't want that. I, want, I shouldn't have that right now. I want to have dinner first. I want that. We might control ourselves, not have that. We still feel like it. And they just stop feeling like it. They just turn off. Not good enough for now. You know, or you, you get an exam, pop quiz, surprise. <laughs> I want my answer right here. We walk off the care of something. It's really tempting to look at those answers. It might not. It might be good. It behave. But the temptation is going to be there, right? Because it would it keeps us off on the day. Because they had a perfect integrity, perfect wholeness of body and soul. So what that means. Yeah. They had immortality, so when it died. And impassibility when it suffered, gets sick. When it break down, it used to be caught. The body of great perfection and grace and strength. So they, they could get hurt. It was almost impossible. It was not like, like they were Superman. But they were so they were they were graceful. They were smart enough to know things would hurt them. And they were they were like the fact the best dancer of math we have yet here. Right. So things went they were very easily. They were smart enough to know when they would get hurt. Be ready to perfect health. God then infused with their hearts for happiness, for contentment. Maybe it was easy. They, they were meant to work with him. It wasn't hard work. Everything was easy. Everything was under, under their control. Enjoyment. And the same that we enjoy, we accomplish a task well, and we say that that feels good to us. We have that all the time. We could always do the Lord's will and please the Lord and all the good in life. Life is good. And they had the supernatural. It's elevated. So if I were to take a Dixie cup, I use a cup that I pot glue that's jewels to. And now I pot glue it to a, to a drum. All of a sudden I have a flying mix cup. <laughs> Change is nature. By itself it can't fly. All of a sudden it can fly. Supernatural is sharing in God's own life. Preparing us for heaven and letting us be good at heaven when the time comes. And that means, therefore, bring us outside of our own, own mountains. Bring us above ourselves, we live with God, walk with God, and share with Him. Most importantly, the sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace gives a supernatural likeness to try and God. In the words of, of some of the saints, it says God looks at them and he sees a reflection of his own being. Remember, the Trinity, the Father looks at the Son and he sees the goodness of the Son. The Son is God, the the Father, and they love that, and the love is the Holy Spirit. When you're, you have a sanctifying grace that looks at you and he sees or flat prayed reflection of that same goodness. God takes pleasure. We have poured this in our souls. Isn't that astonishing? This means then that we're made in friendship with God. We see in the, the book of Genesis, God speaks with the Adam and he talks to him. The book of Genesis chapter 3 after the fall, they hear the voice of the Lord in the garden, and what he's constantly he's want to do, walking in the cool part of the day. So only the one that they have all this, and God's blessed spoke with them. He's a friend to them. He had him. So when they knew. Because of grace, they were adopted sons of God. They had a relationship similar to what the Son has, the Father, in the Creator. But they're the created images of God, and the Son is the divine uncreated image of God. Allow them to marry heaven. Strictly speaking, we can't marry heaven. But once we have this grace in us and God's promises, now our, our works please God and make about joy and happiness, and now the Lord says, what you do for me, 
with me, guide it to me, will help you get to heaven. You will earn heaven in a real sense because of the gifts I give you. You can say, I can walk in heaven and walk with God really have the same divine grace. In the words of Christ in the Last Supper, remain in me as I remain in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit unless there remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain on me. I am the vine of the branches. But if it remains in me will bear in me, and I am him who will bear his fruit. That means me nothing. And what does not remain in me will be brought up in a branch with it. People will gather that and throw the Bible and burn. Because they were friends of God and sons of God, pleased God, they were the heirs of heaven. It was their natural birthright. God planned that he would love their brethren, God prepared the place for them for eternity. And because they were his friends, his companions, those he loved, he dwelt in their soul. Already there was a divine dwelling where, where, where there was a short taste of heaven where God dwelt with them and lived with them. Yet their souls in a special way. And the last son, Jude, which is a species, species today, not the Iscariot, said, Master, what happens is that you will reveal yourself to us, not the world. His answer and said, Whoever loves me will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Well, in the words of St. Paul, the temple of God, the spirit of God was with you. Sanctifying grace goes with these virtues faith, hope, charity, prudence, just temperance, the virtue that gives the Holy Spirit. All of that was in their souls. And of course, you can imagine the great glory and happiness even in the dark. Pretty good, huh? It gets better. So this led to the four great harmonies. First of all, there's a harmony between God and man. We were his friends, his children, those he loved, he loved us, but it's been in heaven. Short time, and then uh, 
Well, then the devil comes. He's an angel who fell over to evade God and tempts him. Because if God really didn't want to have anything good, he goes, well, no, I mean, he said, yeah, everything except this one for him. The devil's well, God just hates him. He knows if you have that tree, you'll be like, I already like it. You'll know good and evil. They already know good and evil. And they're really smart. They have experience with it. He's done it. He's, he's, he's saying, heaven. He beats it. He was an Adam, Adam eats it. Adam, Adam's right there watching watch what's happening and not doing anything about it. And then they realize they were naked and they were ashamed. This raises a number of questions for us. First of all, why did God let us choose happen? This is really cool. Why let us choose happen? I mean, with your kid, you let them, let's say, okay, here's my life, go play, go bad with it. Why does God let us choose happiness like it's so serious? Why not just say, okay, you idiots, I tell you, no, you're a synagogue, you're like, that's enough. But what would have been lost? Do I know? Free love. Free love. Oh, French. All right, love that's not free is a law. And the Lord is not going to force us to fall. But wants us to have a real share of inspiration, a real choice, not just a true choice. Real choice. So the plan for putting that tree there was was kind of to tempt them, to have them choose. It was to give them a chance to choose, but it wasn't an evil choice. It, it, it made a choice possible. Because it was one thing the Lord said, is it for you yet? And by doing so, you're going to, to show your love for me, and from that in your own heart, so pass it on to your children. They were given that at least for a short time. Yeah. But probably not very long. Uh, the context clue is the Lord said at the beginning, be fruitful, multiply. And that and he was still a virgin when, when, when they leave the garden. So probably wasn't very long. Um, at the river. Could be, but probably not. Probably the next day. <laughs> <laughs> next a couple of hours, you know, after lunch. <laughs> probably wasn't very long. Why? But the, the point of it is, is the Lord is not letting them choose. Not simply for it to fall. It's not the Lord's tempting them, them like he's trying to make them fall, but wants their choice to be real and wants their choice to be free. So there can be a friendship, a union, and a love. Which one is this all about? Why was the apple so serious? These are fruit. What's the big deal? Who cares? Right? If someone ate one of your pieces of fruit apple on your tree, you'd be mad. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal. First of all, who's the defendant is God? More, more importantly, remember, it's easy for Adam and Eve to, to, to say no to this. Adam and Eve. Turn that off, right? Yeah. Yeah. They knew what was going on. It wasn't like they were confused about this. We're confused. We're not very smart. Our wills are weak. It's hard for somebody. I, 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 I have a strong wills. They're very smart. They walk with them face to face, walk them face to face. It's like they didn't know what they wanted. It's easy to an easy thing that they were asked to do. And by doing so, what they're saying is God's a liar. And I want this more than God. I'm rejecting God's power. What they're saying is I want the good things of God without God. I want it to come from me and my efforts, my work, not to be a gift. That's why it's so it's the biggest and the fruit, the big deal is going on the inside. They're saying to the, the God, I don't want you. I have to leave you a liar, I don't want what's best for me. And I'm going to trust something else besides you. And I'm going to desire that more than you, and I'm going to want to be great without you. And it was easy to not do this. And all of a sudden, the malice of this is more clear. As the old saying goes, it wasn't the apple on the tree that was the problem, it was the pear on the ground. <laughs> Could we ever pay God by ourselves? No. First of all, the sin's too great. Second of all, you'll let everything. 
So Shannon, if I borrow twenty dollars from you, if I borrow twenty more to pay it back? <laughs> no. <Okay>. <laughs> Why not? Because I'm just giving you you're just giving away my money back that I have to give to you again. That's only twenty. Just put a sign on that says US government. <laughs>
sound, you've got to be okay. I had a particular role was to pass on to us as our first father what he received from God. You know, it'd be like if I, if I, if I, if I become a millionaire, right, and I lose it in gambling, you can't pass on anybody. I mean, the millionaires, they want to gamble it away for now. So the path on to us is now instead of poverty and the endless table of brokenness. Why is this unfair? A few reasons. First of all, it's only unfair if we owe for Odin. God owed us not. We pray for it a lot. So number one, not unfair for that. More importantly, though, God uses this that in Christ, because it's more difficult, because it's more painful, even the punishments, even the losses become more greater and, and a higher blessing. Because of the deeper struggle, there's higher reward. The punishments themselves become part of God's goodness. So death, for example, seems like a really bad thing. What God's doing by allowing us to die? He's saying it's an end to you. Right? If we were stuck in immortal but without death and just stuck in the state of rebellion against God, then we can go to heaven. We all. The Lord says it's an end. Because at the time of testing will only be 70, 80, 100 years. That's all. And, and, and eventually evil will come to an end, only goodness will remain. He wants Adam and Eve's choices to remain, but then because Christ, all of these things become then the great glory of God. What's important then, this becomes the means to which Christ himself comes. Without the fall, there'd be no Redeemer. And the Redeemer comes and brings it closer to heaven, higher than higher to heaven, Closer to the heart of, heart of God. Because now we receive grace not through Adam, through human being, but through God's own Son. Now we have life not through a human being, but through the divine world. Now we are filled and restored, united, not simply as a human race, now we share DNA with God. A human being sits on God's throne as worshipped by the angels and saints. That means that the reward be greater. Our union with God deeper, our place in heaven higher, than it would have been done before. The Lord is so good, He can use even our brokenness to do great things. And the Lord says to us, because your struggle is harder, and your tasks are difficult, the reward will be greater. In the end, they'll be restored. So much will happen. Some will happen, they'll be fixed in heaven. Some are restored by coming to Christ. So death and suffering, I don't have it. Super sanctifying grace because it's been back to Christ. Harmony is restored partially to the gospel and to the faith. What remains, though, is the resurrection, eternal life, which takes place in the way that through Christ. Deeper, closer, higher than than before. Make sense? One more point, a very important point. Uh, and this is the very end. Of the Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We have the very first promise of a Savior. The old word for the scripture verse is the Prophet of Angelic, first gospel. Proto meaning first, like protoplasm, evangelium, like evangelist. the first glimpse of the good news of Christ. Even way before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. was the first Genesis. This is after the fall, where Adam and Eve, Eve are facing God. Is this Adam, why do you do this? Adam goes, well, the woman's fault. She did it. And Steve, Steve, why do you do it? Oh, the snake's fault. He's tempting me. Cut down myself. The devil made me do it. And then God says, this is the devil. That was not a chance to speak because the devil's already been dead. The devil will not against Of an enmity, but more between you and the woman. Your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head and you strike at his heel. This is a promise of the coming of the cross. 
who will crush the devil's head, destroy death, destroy hell, destroy Satan and his power. To the offspring of the Lord. But there's even a, a greater detail here, which is really beautiful in, in my opinion. If you look at where it takes place in the story, going tonight, going to Genesis chapter 3, the part of this, um, you'll see the Lord is going to tell Adam and Eve what punishments going to happen, they're going to suffer, they're going to die. Not that it's told them until after he tells them to be a saint. But it's not that first there's a king of Israel going to punish now about the Savior. There's a Savior, and by the way, Adam, so we thought this will run for you, this work's going to be hard now. Eve, your child is going to be hard, and the gardens to have a garden, and you're going to die. Well, that's after the promise of sin. Which, first of all, shows God's mercy over God's hardness. God is not first angry that they say, oh, fine, forgive me. God already wants to forgive and calls back. Secondly, was the promise of how he was saved. Because when he says to Adam, the earth is going to bring forth thorns and thistles for you, he's saying, I'm going to share them. When he says to Eve, there's your child labor, your child bearing will be great pain. Talking about the cross, the Virgin Mary has let the rest of the world as her children in great pain. The sword pierces her heart. When the death and suffering is talked about, because Christ is going to die, he's going to share his punishments in that name to redeem them in the back of So even before there's the punishments, there's the Savior. We'll enter our punishment to redeem it, to sanctify it, and bring us back to us. We are created by the love, fallen, and redeemed by the Savior of Jesus Christ. Questions? Let's look at the four great um, doctrines. And I do this because I want to connect them again. I don't want to the little box that go around and you want to identify whole. The Trinity. The Incarnation, there we go. and the Church, and that. We're made by God, human. Trinity. We're made for the union of God, heaven and earth, and for the divine well and prepares for that. Where there, where there is this friendship that deepens and grows day by day until he then dwells in God. He dwells in us here, we dwell in God in heaven. He wants heaven to be both a reward and something we earn by being destroyed. The incarnation happens because of the fall. It redeems man because of what our sin. All good things are restored by Christ are now or in heaven in the resurrection. He takes on the sufferings of the fall, and so he fulfills the vocation of Adam and Eve lets us to fulfill our vocation as well. The church is where we get the help. We get the knowledge of what is. We get the grace, the sacraments. We get, we get the gospel. To let's be united in the It's the ordinary means which we receive sanctifying grace all of God. So the church enables us to live as God intends. And we're created by God as body, soul, persons that live on this earth for a period of time, to work with God, and enter into heaven in God's glory. Because of sin, we're created a love, fallen, and redeemed. Redeemed through Jesus Christ, who is truly God, but also true man. Questions? So you're ready to get out of here. Say a prayer. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness to us. Help us to recognize more fully what we are and how you made us. Help us know more fully how to enter into heaven, how to walk with you day by day. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.